way, you know, or the, even the first wave, there was a lot, you know, like the Dead Boys. <laughs> you know, some of the early stuff was really like, you know, in the, uh, I think it was a direct response to feminism of the 70s and kind of in the in your face sort of way. Uh, I'll get swingers. Yeah. And like the cover. Yeah. yeah. They seemed a little bit. Uh, yeah, it was. There was several that were. I mean, but the, you know, the other thing was there was a lot of women stepping forward, which I actually liked. So I kind of liked both things. I was like, you know, but how did I, you know? Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, since it was a collective and it just, you know, and I was like, you know, if you, if you want it, it's, it's really up to the collective if you want to make rules against, <laughs> you know. I said, well, if you go off to the sexist banger now, you're going to knock a whole bunch of them out. But... Certain like the, the dwarves, I just that was <laughs> it wasn't a, that I really wanted to make a statement about that, but I wanted to make some statement about some other stuff, like when they beat up somebody expressing their opinion that they were sexist. That was kind of a <laughs> it's like you know, <laughs> the dwarfs did, yeah, they, they beat on this guy who was like on the stage, like getting his getting in their face about being sexist, which they certainly were. Uh, but I was still in kind of anti censorship stuff, so uh. You know, so, but I was like, you can't, you can't beat somebody. That's a big thing for me, the Gilman Street thing, is anybody should be able to go to the stage and express whatever they feel like, <laughs> you know, and not get beaten up for it. <laughs> so it's like the doors are like, wait a minute, we're, we're in your headliners, how can you do that? <laughs> <It's> easy. <laughs> now, did you, so I'm guessing you probably had the same reaction to like the feeder's performance. Art is, art for art's sake. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as controversial as it was, it was definitely a statement. Uh, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm an animal lover, you know, personally. Yeah, yeah. But still, you know, I, you know. Well, it was just, definitely people's face. <laughs> right. No, yeah, and somebody else wanted to do that later on, the like, beat of dead horses. Like, we kind of already did that. <laughs> you know? They really wanted to bring in a horse? A dead horse. Like they were saying punk was beating a dead horse and they want to literally do it. And I'm like, ah, yeah, I, don't know. I think the reaction to that, especially considering the fear stuff, especially since I, I felt like it had already been done. Sure. <laughs> like if I make the statement again. So, Plus the sort of thing, you know, every time things got crazy, we got to clean it up, right? I didn't feel like cleaning up a dead horse. <laughs> no. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, that is that is absolutely wild. <laughs> yeah. So, so so you for many years you, you are we good we're good to go. Yeah, yeah. You, for many years you've been an artist and activist in in the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and involved in in the in not only the DIY uh, and activism communities, but but then uh, in the punk scene even before Gilman. Yeah, I was I was definitely one of the early punks. You know, first wave as we call it nowadays. Uh, yeah, because... Was yeah. that San Francisco, or...? Well, I, I, you know, I grew up in uh, places like New Hampshire and Hyannis, Massachusetts, but I was... My parents, my mother was very into the, the 60s stuff, so I needed my rebellion. So I put on a Stooges <laughs> fun house, and she said, what is that? <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, I got my rebellion. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so... A lot of the early stuff, like the New York Dolls, and, uh, you know, certainly Raw Power, the Stooges, those kind of like that kind of define the sound right there. <laughs> you know, you so know. You were hooked. Uh, I wouldn't say I was hooked right away. I was, but I was interested because <laughs> it was different. You know, I mean, I could see that it was kind of like let's strip things down. You know, and of course, then you know the Ramones came in with that, which are. Uh, in the Gilman Street book where they say deal in the deal. It's actually the Ramon Blitzrig blah, blah, <laughs> going up and down. Because, uh, you know, the Ramones were, you know, the whole New York scene. Yeah. You said doing the deal? Well, in the Gilman Street book, they, they have a picture of me. Uh, what, what I'm actually doing is imitating the Ramones. Uh, they would go. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, uh, but they called it? Blitzrig bop. But you said doing the deal, is it? They were saying that you. Yeah, they were like it was my own dance, and, uh, and uh, not that I don't make up my own dances, but that, was, that particular point I was put, uh, you know, in the picture because I was going up and down and with the legs apart. So that was the, the blitzkrieg bop. <laughs> All right. So, um, so yeah, uh, the, the more elaborate kind of, uh, the more even you can use the subject and the answer, or kind of re- kind of repeat 
that stuff, okay. more of that helps. But so, can you can you talk about? Um, you, you worked at Gilman from the very beginning, is that right? From the opening of the place. Well, I heard this. There were there was this warehouse scene going on, and they were looking for artists. So I was an artist. So I wanted, you know, they were going to paint the walls. So that was my original interest. And uh, I think it was Victor from the art committee because he kind of bailed out pretty quick. <laughs> so it was like, okay, where does that leave us, you know? Because uh, at that point, as I said before, I was, you know, I gotten kind of disenchanted with some of the punk stuff. With a lot of what came the skinhead movement because we had the Berkeley Thrashers Union and the. And I was like, I don't want to be associated with this right wing stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, what was the Berkeley Thrashers Union? Uh, they were pretty right wing. They wanted to support Reagan going after El Salvador. And I remember us like, let's raise a fund and send them there on one way. Because <laughs> uh, I, you know, I used to. Because then I was kind of more in a pagan new wave thing. So there was a big clash, <laughs> you know. And, uh, because at a certain point, I just grabbed their leader and the rest of <laughs> It's like, well, you can come at us, but your, your leader is going to be. <laughs> so they, they had to back off. Uh, so so, the, so the, the Berkeley Thrashers Union was a skinhead group that would kind of come to shows? Yeah, I would say it was like the, yeah. I mean, because a lot of the Southern California, there was a hardcore, some of the hardcore scene, you know, there was a certain amount. I mean, not that that wasn't there from the big get-go. I mean, there was always that element of punk. But for me, that seemed like where would things were, that was something I really wanted to disassociate myself from. Plus, I was also kind of like, it's just coming very formalistic. It's just, <laughs> you know, where the early punk was a lot more creative. Uh, what did you see going on, uh, like say in San Francisco, and aside from the Berkeley Thrashers Union in Berkeley that, that say was different than what you found at Gilman? Uh, well, I mean, the biggest thing, obviously, was most of the clubs in San Francisco, they were like places you went to drink, so you didn't have younger people, uh, which, you know, way was pretty important as far as what I, I, for, I, I thought that was one of the things that Gilman Street did, you know. But, you know, I also felt there was a creative thing that came in, you know, even though, you know, I mean, I was critical of some of the political correctness of some of the scene there, but there was a lot of, you know, but we were looking at ways to get it creative, you know. Uh, you know, there was talk about doing an alternative thing, but it was still kind of like, uh, well, I remember talking to our puzzling evidence from Subgenius, <laughs> and so, so of us were like, how do we make this thing a little bit more on the edge? Uh, but there was stuff going on in San Francisco, like groups like Tragic Mulatto. I mean, there was, interest, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on in the city. Uh, you know, so some of them started playing at Gilman Street. Uh, you know, you know some of the ones we were talking about earlier, like groups like Carolina Rainbow, <laughs> which is you know. So I was interested in that sort of stuff. You know, stuff that was a little bit more on the on the edge of stuff, which you had from you know San Francisco. I had a certain creative edge to it. You know. Uh, but the, the you know the p politics of it came more important as it as like because I was getting back into being political, uh, and I would say being involved with Gilman Street was a big part of that. Is getting back into because I was pretty much like part of the pagan scene, being an artist, you know, and I was actually like ch I was very into erotic art, so I was, which didn't quite fit with <laughs> you know, but that was part of what I was into, uh, which was. Obviously, it led to some of the scandals, <laughs> like the Insaints and stuff like that that came on later, you know. Uh, Did you book that Insaints show? Or uh, well, uh, there was one, there was one show, because the white trash debutantes, like Ginger Coyote, who's obviously been around the scene for quite a while, because at a certain point she just grabbed me from the pit and she started stripping me. <laughs> So Mary Ann says, well, I want to do the same thing. I said, well, I just did that, so let's." <laughs> so I dressed up like Uncle Sam because there was a benefit around People's Park because there was a big volleyball court stuff. So she played for that. So we did that. So, of course, well, that well, wasn't quite as scandalous because now they're, <laughs> but they were, you know, I could have easily been in a, a kind of scandal there, and she kind of, like, from there started doing some of her other stuff. I mean, the infamous one with the banana. 
because I was kind of protecting her head from being smashed, <laughs> you know, or she was getting eat out, eaten out by some of her dominatrix friends. Uh, and of course, that's when she got arrested, and that was actually the last night I saw her. Yeah, but. So let's get back to um, you coming into Gilman. You said that you came in as an art person. Can you describe the place when you saw it, and was there a particular energy? Were people excited that it was a new thing? And, and what, what did you do? You painted the walls. Uh, can you talk about the, that process? Okay, so we had an art committee, but it was exciting that there were groups, different groups. There was, there was a lot of meetings before Gilman Street happened, so there was, there was a real sense of like, we're doing this together, and so there was a lot of excitement around that. Uh, you know, lots of discussions, and it, you know, it took a while to get through the process stuff before Gilman Street, because it was like a New Year's thing. Um, uh, but I was particularly interested in the art stuff, so I, I did actually paint some stuff on. I, well, I did, I'm painting an Iggy Pop, and uh, I did one of the Ramones, and I did one of uh, Judy Garland. <laughs> Which people were like, what's that flying in there? But I wanted to do it, uh, you know. And actually, at a certain point, because I was like, let's just repaint, let's redo the walls. We painted it all white so that people could do that again. And within, <laughs> just so quick, it just, the graffiti thing just came in real fast. But, uh, even though I was a little disappointed because <laughs> I wanted to paint something, uh, but it was kind of like, well, oh, that's 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 real punk, <laughs> you know. That you know that was an expression that was coming from, and so ever since it's had the graffiti thing, uh, so that was common art. <laughs> Who are some of the other people that were were trying to paint or, or do art with you on the committee? Mm. Uh, it's hard for me to remember, because Victor, right. Victor kind of bailed out fairly quickly, which was a little concerned, because he was the one that was really pushing for that alternative energy. So the, do, you, do you have any memories of the Mindfuck Committee? Yeah. What was that? Uh, there was something, I mean, that Maximum Rock and Roll came out of, you know, but it was a way to kind of prevent things from falling into a, like, you know, judicial club situation, you know, so. You know, and always those of us that were interested in how to change that were kind of like, that kind of got our attention, because <laughs> that's part of our intention, was to, you know, is to not have it to be a, just a formalistic club, you know. Uh, and uh, actually, I can't remember much of what, what the actual, uh, but there were certain things that would happen in the shows, you know. And um, the other thing is because people didn't, they weren't coming because, there was no advertising, so there was no, like, you didn't know who you were gonna see, so it was already that unexpected thing. Uh, for me, punk was, one of the things I really liked about punk, early punk was the flyers. So I really kinda wanted, I was challenging that. I wanted to, you know, because to me that was, well, it was for me I was a, as an artist, that was a way to express myself, you know, which when I was involved with Gilman Street, I was doing pretty much two flyers a week, and I was doing a lot of the flyering, you know. And, uh, You'd post them everywhere as well? Yep, I sure we did, <laughs> all over town. <laughs> so, uh, I still actually spent a lot of time just doing that. Where did you post them? Oh, obviously places like Telegraph, which I already have a place, you know, Shattuck, down San Pablo. Actually, at a certain point when we redid the permit, we actually got permission <laughs> to put flyers on Shattuck and Telegraph, you know. Because at that point, they. Uh, they wanted to take our advertising away because we we did little ads, yeah. Uh, yeah, and some of the things, obviously, because my name was on the line, I wanted to make sure that we could pay the rent. Despite the Gilman Street, did every time I was there, I pay, we paid the rent. <laughs> Sometimes we had to get bailed out toward the end, you know, when when Jesse pulled out because he was he was bringing a lot of the, the you know the band a lot of the shows were you know but fortunately bands like Fugazi and very small records and lookout records, they all came up with something, so we were able to pay the, that's one of the things I want to straight because I, I do want to let people know that I did get the rent paid every single time, <laughs> and I was proud of that, you know. Uh, so you, so, uh, so let's talk, let's talk about that. I, I do want to talk about, you mentioned the, the changes in the pits, but we'll get to that. Um, so you went from doing the art committee to start to being head coordinator. Yeah, well, Jonathan was looking around like who could do this, and he, 
he was definitely one to pull me because I had kind of moved away from Gilman, so he brought me back into that, you know. Uh, you know, and I did several shows, and there were not punk shows like I was doing the, the you know, like uh, you know, the funk thrash shows, <laughs> and I did a couple of folk shows with Penelope Houston, uh, and uh, yeah, actually the first show I did was when well, I was still Maximum Rock and Roll. It was uh, Harmonic Divergence. That was kind of more on the p pagan side. It was kind of a, a a satire on the whole harmonic convergence thing, you know. So we had like, we had laser light shows going on in a black room with our, uh, one of the women, Demetria from, uh, she did this, we did this whole back, we took the back room, we turned it into a black light room with, you know, different paintings from different cultural, religious cultural icons. <laughs> but, you know, it was a satire on the whole new age harmonic convergence thing, so. And that actually did pretty well, I got, you know, about, 225 people, which the maximum roll, roll people were kind of threatened by that, because <laughs> it was like, like it was almost not, the people went that were almost a whole different scene. Uh, but. Do you have any memories or stories of Tim Young? What was he like? Uh, well, it turned out I embraced a lot of his vision about like the collectivity. I just, I think he was such a strong figure, he kind of got in the way of that because everybody saw him as a, you know, but even though I was critical of him being politically correct, because I can identify that with the hippie thing, because I used to call him the hippie. <laughs> but you know, eventually I winded up embracing that, and I was—he was very supportive when I was in that role. You know, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, he was very supportive when we decided to take on the, the, the you know, the, the racist skinheads. I mean, he was, you know, he was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> you know, he was supportive in a lot of ways. So. Uh, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm probably he was probably nervous for me coming in because I was the one that was like <laughs> non-punk, talking about you know doing something a little more creative with the space. But I was pretty much like, I'm going to give the kids what they want. They want a punk rock club, as long as the word the world and work for it and be collective about it. I was like, they're going to get a punk rock club for the most part. Okay, we'll throw in some stuff, <laughs> you know, the deal shows, which a lot of the shows I did before is because I had the time to really like go and see bands and stuff like that. Once I started running the place, I didn't really, I didn't really have the time for that. And fortunately, Jesse stepped in, you know, I mean, because we were in, we were in some trouble at that point, <laughs> you know. Um, That's before George Hated. That's right as George Hated came in. George Hated didn't, George Hated kind of, yeah, I guess he came in shortly there because, you know, by the time we had to deal with the, I mean, because I was very clear that I was going to challenge, you know, this, uh, the right wing skinhead thing, even though he was a black skinhead. <laughs> uh, but he definitely came in, and uh, you know, I put Nando in charge, because I, I, you know, I was clearly uh, we're going to we're going to make a stand here. We're not going to like let them dominate the pit. I was not okay with that. Uh, um, uh, so, so can you? Can you talk about that? That you said there was a, a far difference between the metal pits and the, the, the pits you had seen in the Bay Area than, say, the Gilman pit. And, and ultimately, maybe talk about the c kind of dancing that you did. Okay. Well, when the because some of these skinheads, when I first came in, they were really coming in a dominated pit, and some of them were pretty brutal, you know. And I, I really didn't like that. I didn't feel like that, you know. I mean. I mean, the pit for me was always a place, you know, I mean, to get some anger out, but to, you know, I wanted it to be, well, especially since my name was on the insurance, <laughs> I didn't really want to deal with those consequences, or, but I also felt like, you know, I'd seen like early situations where, you know, punks like really like smashed small women and stuff like that. And I had some of that stuff, I just wasn't, you know, to me it was more of a, it was, a, it was more of a formal, a ritual doing the pit, you know? Uh, as long, but I didn't want to see people like being deliberately hurt. Uh, that was one of the things I really had about the, you know, uh, some of the skinhead stuff was it seemed like that, that was that was happening, and I, I didn't want to see that happen. I wanted, well, especially since it was an underage club, I wanted people to feel like they could express themselves, but also a certain amount of safety. I mean, obviously, we're, in, <laughs> I mean, it was kind of a risky situation to even put my name on the stuff, but. But it was coming more from a place of like, concern for, you know, that people feel like they could come to Gilman Street, you know, or parents could feel like they could send their kids without them getting injured, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, so what was different about the Gilman Pit and, and, and about the kind of dancing that you would do? 
Uh, well, I mean, one of the things I, with the pit is I kind of try to do, like get in there sometimes. You know, some of those just to show that I'm, <laughs> is, you know, I mean, I was still kind of doing the male assertive thing, you know, and that was one way to do it. I was, you know, uh, but it was different than, because uh, I was talking to you earlier about like heavy metal pits where, you know, I felt like they were coming after me deliberately <laughs> and I didn't like that situation. So, uh, so I didn't see that kind of, like deliberate malice, you know. You know, I liked heavy metal, <laughs> but that was one of the things I didn't like about heavy metal. <laughs> I didn't like going to shows for heavy, you know. And, I mean, one of the things I, that I talked about coming in Gilman Street is I really wanted to challenge the pay-to-play thing that was happening in the heavy metal scene, and people were like, "I don't know if we want to go there," <laughs> uh, you know. But it was enough situation. I mean, one of my favorite Gilman Street things is Paul Ratt, who dominated the heavy metal thing. It was a lot of the, that pay-to-play thing of like. Basically, you play, and if you don't bring in your friends, you lose your equipment. And I was like, that's not okay. I want to challenge that. So I came. You know, this is a time where, you know, it was right at the beginning, so it was physically challenging. I didn't know whether I was going to be able to pull this off. So he was going to try to buy us out, basically. And, uh, you know, some of the punk kids, they just ran him off. He never had a chance to even come to me. But I, when I heard about it, he was like, that's cool. I like that. You know, you're asserting that you want to keep your club. <laughs> so, you you know, but, uh, you know, and early on, also Bill Graham sent a representative. They were pretty much like, nobody likes a quitter. <laughs> I mean, they probably heard that I was a little bit more open to pop, a pop sensibility. That was one of the scandals with the Max Mercado stuff is that I actually said that, uh, you know, I, I'm interested in influencing pop culture. Uh, so, but he was like, we'll offer you a job if you hang in here. I mean, by the time I was done with Gilman Street, there was like absolutely no way that I was interested. I pretty much had done my, you know, running a club was kind of something I had dreamt about, you know? I mean, so Gilman, I was like, okay, I did it. I did my, <laughs> I got my rock and roll dream, you know, I did what, you know, so. Um, but Bill Graham offered you a job, the Bill Graham folks did. Yeah, yeah, if I hung in there. If you hung in Gilman? Yeah, if I kept it going. And part of the thing is like, okay, we're the feeder system. We give chance of new bands a chance to make it, you know, basically, you know, get some exposure. That was something that was really important to me at Gilman Street is that we gave a lot of bands their first show. Like I often would purposely hang out for like the first bands a lot and dance around to them because it's important to cultivate, you know. And some aren't that good, you know, but you know, a certain amount, if you keep playing, you have a place to play, and you have a life, you're gonna get good. Because we saw that continually. We saw bands that, you know, because they had a place to play, they got they got good, you know. Uh, you know. Did, so, but, but whereas Tim Johannem was kind of like, well, we're not gonna be a farm for, for, the, for the majors or, or anything like that. Yeah, it's not like I didn't have any of those criticisms, <laughs> you know, but it was less so. Definitely less so. I mean, uh, I wasn't against the uh, what happened actually, where bands actually, you know, made it. You know, got some certain level of success. Uh, I was like with Tim Armstrong, I remember, because he was like out in the streets you know, on a skateboard. Uh, you know, he was like, "I got this new band." He kept coming up, to me. <laughs> and I said, "Well, most of the bands don't want to make it, but Tim, you've got to make it. <laughs> I don't see you doing anything else in your life, and this is a good band, so I'll stick with it." But I also felt like I could see hear from them that they they had some potential to actually get some following. You know, uh, you know, uh, I mean, so bands like Green Day or, or Rancid and other bands that came out of the scene, I don't, I don't, I have no problem with the fact that they made it where other people like that's like, they don't accept that. <laughs> I, I mean, to me, it's like, that's actually influencing a larger culture. So I like that about, you know, when Green Day came out with American Idiot, for instance, that was, that's like, that's the uh, national statement, you know, that needed to be made at that point, you know, um, so. It's, it's, I like turning on the radio and hearing, hey, that's my homies, <laughs> you know. That's good, I, we, you know, we have pictures of you, uh, on stage at a Green Day show, yeah. Uh, to, uh, to Jesse would Jesse would say Michael was sometimes in his own world with his dancing. Yeah. Can you? I mean, can you talk about what was, was the kind of ritual uh, that you would you would do? I mean, this is kind of a uh, a next level thing to you for you, the dancing. Or is it, is it, that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had always been into dancing since I was like in junior high, dancing the James Brown record. <laughs> uh, 
But at a certain point, like in college, I started studying like dance, you know, dance religions, like particularly African religions, where you know, and actually went through an African initiation. So <laughs> that kind of made me like really aware that you know, dance itself, and of course, some of the if I'm in my own world, it's like I'm in a trance state. <laughs> so you know, it's basically you know, it's like a lot of older cultures, the shamanistic tradition of the of the dance. You know, and I'm part native, so that's part of our tradition as well. You know, <laughs> but all cultures if you go back. Uh, yeah, you know, the pit in a way. That's like that's a that's a group ritual. <laughs> yeah, you know, the circle. Yeah. Uh, but you wouldn't always kind of just go. With it. I didn't always feel like because I really want. I didn't always feel like. Well, I wasn't really a big follower. <laughs> I often wanted. I wanted to express my own self, and you know, uh, you know. So if I didn't feel like I didn't want to get pulled into something. You know, so sometimes when I felt like people were trying to pull me in and I didn't want to, that's where I started pogoing, going up and down. <laughs> it's kind of hard to, <laughs> kind of hard to get somebody when they're jumping up and down. But you know, that was the original punk thing. You know, uh, you know, the pit didn't come in until, you know, punk had been around for a little while. Uh, so uh, when you became head coordinator, you said that uh, John Denlinger he. He uh, was looking for somebody to take it over. Can you talk about that transition and uh, maybe, and you started also booking, uh, occasionally you said the deal shows. Uh, can you talk about the, I guess the, that, that transition leading up into uh, more about what kind of bands you, you booked? Uh, yeah, well one of the things I had done is, because I was working with the Berkeley Free Clinic, so we put together, uh, it was an anniversary show, where it was also a benefit for the free, free clinic. And that was another show where it was almost none of the Gilman Street scene, but it did well, you know. And a lot of that was bands that would play like the Starry Plow, like the Vicious Hippies and Buffalo Rome and Midnight Radio. Uh, so it wasn't bands that most of the people that went to Gilman Street would be that interested in. You know, Jonathan. At a certain point, like the clubs, are, <laughs> they just gave me the keys. You know, you, you know, you, the club's yours because I'm going home. <laughs> and he knew that, I, and that was part of it. Okay, well, he was testing me to see whether I could just run the show by myself or with my folks. Uh, I definitely did like a bunch of uh, Primus shows, and I would bring other bands from the uh, Funk Thrash. You know, because I was dance. It was very dance oriented. And I was into that. And plus, I was interested in like playing something a little different than what Lou was doing because he was doing the ska thing. But you know, but there was an example of bringing something else that was a little, even though you know, right from early English punk, there was always a connection between punk and ska. Uh, so. What was Lou's role in everything? Well, he had a real sleazy reputation, <laughs> which I don't know how much is like verified or not, but it was there was definitely that in the air. And even though I was definitely challenging some of the erotic lines, I felt like some of the stuff he was doing, like, you know, or what was he was accused of, you know, like, I mean, obviously in an all ages club, there's a certain line you want to pay attention to. <laughs> or I don't know, I'm not saying he did any of that, but there were certainly rumors to that effect, you know. And uh, so I didn't, that I didn't really, you know, uh, if those things were true, I didn't approve of some of that stuff, you know, because I, I mean, I, I was pretty sensitive, like, you know, as much as what I had done, it was all, you know, that was something that was, I mean, it's obviously right, because an all ages club and some of the stuff I did was definitely controversial, but I didn't feel like I was, uh, you know, taking advantage of a power situation with somebody that's really too young to, I wasn't particularly interested in that anyways. Uh, so did Tim come back and visit? Uh, what were you? You basically, John took, had it had it for an interim moment, but really you're the the first coordinator after all of it, the first long term coordinator after Tim left. Did would, what were your memories of him coming back? Did he still support the place? Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Uh. Um. Uh, well, he just, I mean, it's pretty much like any kind of support you need. I mean, I, you know, I think he was happy to realize that I was going to keep it a punk rock club. I think that was the first nervousness, obviously, because that was his big thing. And anyway, it was clear that I, you know, had made a decision to, you know, to, you know, give the kids what they wanted. This is what they want. They want a punk rock club. <laughs> this is a collective. 
And, you know, and I think he liked that, that I was bringing back the collective. You know, that was something that was also very important to me that we shared, just like it needs to be, you know, because I come from anarchist, syndicalist kind of roots, so I wanted to, you know, uh, so, you know, there was some Tim was a little bit more socialistic, but I'm a little bit more socialistic these days anyways, because of a lot of the work I do, I'm, you know, fighting for government programs for poor people. Uh, no, he was very supportive, very supportive, you know. Uh, so, uh, can you talk about I mean, there's certain bands he was urging me to, I mean, some of the, the San Francisco bands, and I was usually like, sure, we'll get them in. Yeah. Uh, can you describe um, the shows of, of these three bands? Steel Pole Bathtub, Carolina Rainbow, and the Beatniks. Can you talk about their stage performances? We'll, we'll start with Steel Pole Bathtub, perhaps. Uh, uh, God, I haven't even thought of that band in a long time, <laughs> so I don't remember a whole lot. What about lot. Carolina Rainbow? Well, Carolina Rainbow, they kind of, I'd seen them a lot before, you know, where they kind of like, you know, they, they did a lot to break down the audience band thing. They did a lot of stuff to kind of, you know, people rolling around on the floor, and, <laughs> you know, so there was a certain creative madness where they actually engaged people. And, you you know, you partially went to a Carolina Rainbow expecting to do that, you know. Uh, so. Uh, what about the Beatniks? Beatniks were, because you could see they were coming from a whole different place. I mean, they were beating on stuff. So actually a lot of the bands I liked were, <laughs> you know, bands that beat on things, <laughs> you know. Uh, like, you know, Crash Worship was big then, you know. Uh, and uh, so, but, you know, obviously it's a black band, you know, and Michael Frantic was like, <laughs> this tall guy banging on stuff. And there was obviously a political message, but in a whole different, you know, you could hear the, there was some jazz influence on what they were doing. You could just pick that up and you'd almost never heard that in Gilman Street, <laughs> you know. Crash Worship, and those shows were that happened at Gilman as well. Yeah, I think they, I think they, you know, I, I mean, I saw them in a number of different venues, but I'm pretty sure they, I'm sure they did actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did they bring the fire and wine into Gilman? Uh, I seem to recall it got messy. <laughs> uh, so maybe you could. Talk but there were other bands that got messy too. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't know, it was a Socracy or one of the band. Like, right from the get-go, there were people throwing, <laughs> there were some bands where they were known for throwing stuff in the audience, and we had a big cleanup, but you know, it was like part of the, you know, uh, you know. And I think that was some of the, like, <laughs> like not doing the what you would expect at a regular show, you know. Uh, uh, could you talk a bit more about uh, the Primus shows at Gilman? Those were really big shows and really good for the club. But yeah. It was, you know, that, a band like that was typically playing Berkeley Square. How did you, was, was there, did you have to convince them to play, or how did that all happen? Yeah, I, I deliberately went out and cultivated them. You know, part of me was, uh, I obviously danced, so they, <laughs> they knew I was into their music. Uh, but, you know, I was like, you know, like at the Berkeley Square at one point, I kind of like, you know, and they were playing at the Omni with some of the heavy metal stuff, you know. Or, but, you know, and they also saw that since I was into them, I was, they were still kind of like trying to build up, you know, so that was part, you know, I, I'm sure I, what I did help them get, you know, at a certain point they got too big. Uh, but, you know, the the New Year's show, which was one of the first shows that I did that, you know, because that's where I decided we're going to raise the price a little bit more so that, you know, somewhere around there we started the membership stuff, you know, where, you know. Anyway, I knew that it was like the, none of those people would be members. However, <laughs> I mean, I was definitely looking to the bottom line there. You know, I said I don't want to make this a general policy, but I'm actually doing it to sustain the club. You know, uh, you know, and it's like some of those like, well, it's actually a different scene, so it's not. You know, uh, but still, everybody was required to get a membership card. Yeah, yeah, and some of the things. I mean. We wanted, uh, there was a kind of thing like if you did the card, you were actually agreeing to certain standards of <laughs> behavior, basically. There's certain things in the card. Uh, but since I really was into the, you know, I want to encourage people to get involved, to be part of it, come to the, the meetings. And I was like, you know, you're a member now, you know. And when we, 
did the nonprofit, I, I went on my way to try to make sure, just like at the free clinic where it's, there's nobody in charge, you know, I wanted to make sure. Learned that those those didn't uh, <laughs> that, that all the work because we had to redo the nonprofit stuff, you know, had been done right. So, but I thought a lot of that got sustained, but you know, a lot of it did get sustained. I mean, it continued to be a, it continues to be a collective, you know. Uh, so, uh. so uh, do you uh, do, you said Tim was still supportive of the club, but did he have any other roles? Did he continue to? Did they just come to shows and see how things were going, to see if you know this baby that he had birthed was doing okay? You said that he was happy that there was still punk stuff going up because he thought you were going to mostly bring in wild stuff or you know Berkeley stuff or whatever. He was. Did he do anything else? Did he continue to donate or participate in any way? Well, not really. I mean, you know, he would write about the bands. I mean, he continued to cover the scene for Max and Rock and Roll. But, you know, I, I think he, he really wanted to disengage before, you know. He put a lot of energy into it and had to disengage. And I think he was happy that it was self-sustaining, that he didn't. There was a few times where the early is like it seemed like he, he was willing to do so if it came down to that. But, uh, uh, I mean, at a certain point he said, like, because he was realizing I was struggling with it and before it started to take off. So I think he... I don't think he really wanted to, but he was willing to, if, if we were going to keep with the, the punk thing. But it didn't really turn out to be necessary. Uh, you, know, you know, later on, it's some of the other, you know, like obviously Lookout Records, I felt like in a way, you know, because well, well, look at who the roster of Lookout Records, obviously there was, a, there was a direct connection between, you know, what was good for them and what was good for us, you know. That was definitely appreciative, like, <laughs> you know, people stepping up at that point. So can you talk about uh, holding, you had weekly rituals at the club, uh, pagan meetings. Can you describe what that is and talk about that? We didn't have weekly meetings there. I mean, we had, a, I think it kind of stuck out to people because when we did it, it was kind <laughs> of, uh, you know. Uh, tell us what that, what that is. Tell the story or, or describe what what you did there with the meetings. Uh, Aaron Kamabus recently said 7 p.m. Uh, uh, satanic orgies, he, he joked. Uh, I mean, well, what, you mentioned the women in red coming in during the vagrants practice. What what did you do, and how often did you do it, and what 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 was it all about? Uh, well, I mean, I was definitely into, into, into pagan rituals, and I was into magic, uh, and some of that thing. I mean, that particular instance, because we were getting ready basically to go to war. <laughs> That's the red color, you know, because we were, you know, getting ready to, uh, we knew there was going to be battle with uh, you know, the right wing skinheads. So I was definitely like, because <laughs> as soon as I pulled out the sword, the vagrants took off. <laughs> they liked the red women, but, you know, some of the point where we're like, ah, I'm ready, you know. Because, uh, you know, I pretty much told, a lot of the, you know, the skins I was outside is like, you can join my gang, because <laughs> no more peace punks. And a lot of them did, they are like, hey, a warrior. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, so, so I'm, I'm getting a lot here, but I'm not understanding. You were saying that you had a sword and that you were trying to convert the peace punks to take action? Well, that was kind of lead up, but there was some magic around, you know, making, you know, cause, you know, I mean, there was a time where we did a, like a, 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 a right to Venus, love goddess. <laughs> and that was a weird one because suddenly some of the, you know, the folks that hung outside, just like the, the security guard came out in and this is really weird because they're all like making love in the creek. <laughs> we're not having any problems tonight, so I guess the magic's working. Uh, yeah. So, so what, what, uh, what, was, what, what was the meeting called? Was there a name of the, for the meetings? Or? Uh, well, because I had been involved with a group called the Ordo Templi Orientalis, uh, you know, uh, which actually got raided by the, you know, like the police. So I felt like we were dealing with some amount of religious persecution uh, at the time for our beliefs, you know. I mean, at a certain point I had a break with them, you know. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of the stuff that gets associated with it, because it's obviously, 
well, not obviously to people, but it was connected to Aleister Crowley, which people have strange ideas about who, what he represents, you know. Uh, you know, and so I didn't like to talk about it too much because people would make weird associations with that. Uh, and uh, I mean, there was definitely, our uh, sexuality was an important part of it. I mean, there was all this thing about drugs, <laughs> you know, using that to alter consciousness. Or, uh, I, you know, I was kind of shifting from, because I, I think some of the appeal of Crowley was, because he, you know, he was male dominant and sexism, and I was really shifting at that point, because I had a thing where the goddess came down, and I was shifting to be more of a goddess worshiper, so, and that eventually led to a break at that point. But, you know, I tried to get Neurosis to do a thing, you know, and they were like, they backed away, because even they were scared of, like, what, it's like, because of the rep, you know, but I was like, wait, you know, the police came and pulled guns on us for our religious beliefs, you know, you're not gonna stand for it, <laughs> you're not gonna stand, that's not okay with you, is it? Or, you know. Uh, what did they say? Did they play? No, they didn't play. Uh, you know, and I was hoping to bring, I mean, initially I was trying to bring some of the people from, uh, from that scene, and, and you know, because I was part of my thing, it's like this is my intention, you know, is to you know use the arts. Uh, you know, there's always been a strong connection between rock and roll and music and the occult, uh, but you know, most of them didn't didn't hang with it. I mean, there was a time where this one of the guys, Screamer, came in. It's like the Satanists are taking over, and you know, the Sinister Sisters of Satan are right behind me in full, <laughs> with their whips ready, and they're like, and I was like. Because there was a friend of mine who was doing some weird artwork, and they were thinking he was it. And I was like, why do you think this? Why do you think the Satanists are taking over? But I was kind of smirking because it's like, I got the sisters, sisters of Satan behind me there. But, you know, it was the sort of thing I had to kind of live down because people were like, come up to me. And I was like, I want to study the dark arts. And I was like, I'm trying to run a club right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it wasn't as kind of heavy-handed. It was a serious ritual, but there wasn't this kind of uh, plight to take over <laughs> like this. Well, it didn't work. <laughs> there may have been a plot there, but at you know, a certain point, it was like, this ain't working the way it is, you know, and uh, it just kind of shifted pretty quickly. Uh, and, uh, you know, and and you know, some of the, the breakthrough break there was because it was very hierarchical, very Masonic. Uh, of course, male dominated, uh, and I was kind of really moving to more like you know consensus based. In fact, I used that term. They're like, we can't we can't have you in charge of our stuff because we don't believe in consensus. Like, well, sorry, that's what I do. Uh, so I was you know I was in doing a major change at that point. Uh, you know. Um, Did you uh, can you tell the story of uh, of starting a meeting at the end of the vagrants practice? And uh, you said, uh, we talked about Davy C's reaction, the women in red. And well, all these women came in dressed in red, because uh, that's the color of Mars. So they came in, <laughs> and they all started to dance. So, you know, Davy C liked that. I mean, it was like, you know, it was different. It was different than their usual show. <laughs> so he got, it seemed like he got a kick out of it. Uh, I just know when I came, <laughs> the next part of the ritual, I, tam I pulled out the sword and raised it up. <laughs> and they were like, they, 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 the little, uh, you know, people bailed out pretty quick. <laughs> they didn't want to see where that was going to go, but it was definitely, I was, you know, invoking the war god. Uh, what, what other kinds of rituals? You said there was, you would evoke, evoke the goddess and, and Venus and the war god. And what, what, other, what other things would you try to, to bring? through the rituals? A lot of what I did was just to keep the money coming in. <laughs> money magic. I mean, a lot of it was about that, because that was important to me, that we'd be able to sustain ourselves as a business. You uh, did rituals to try to make the money come in? Yeah, I would say successfully, because I was able to pay the rent. <laughs> um, and sometimes it, did, it wasn't always clear to me how was, that was going to happen, you know? I mean, obviously, sometimes I'd go out of my way because the flying obviously helped. Yeah. Uh, but. Could you? Could you? Do you have any memories of like a ritual in particular that you would do to try to make the money, to make sure the rent was paid? A lot. It was simple candle magic. You know, you take a candle and you etch whatever energy you're trying to put. You know, you put sigils. 
then there was a certain amount of sex magic that went with it, but I won't. <laughs> You'll have to study that more if you're interested in that. <laughs> uh, Got it, digging deep here. So, so um, you, you talked about um, the, a popstitute show where you said first, I'm wondering if you could even just say this again because it was, we said this before the interview, but yeah. first we took on the racism, then we took on the homophobia, then we took on the sexism. The popstitutes were the ones that yeah, because I, I saw a lot of homophobia in the in the in the in the punk scene at the time, and I really, as somebody who's bisexual, I really wanted to challenge that. So we did this whole thing where, and I don't know if that because we came out of something. I don't know if that was a big vulva, but you know, we basically exposed ourselves as like we came a bunch of us from the scene. We came out like, you know. These are the people in the scene <laughs> that aren't straight. And I was one of the ones that came out and, you know, let people know where that was at, you know. So, like, that was actually very effective. It really kind of shifted things. So like, the, a lot of the homophobia just, at least people got the message of, like, you know, this is, we're, we're giving you a very deliberate message that this is not okay. And the popstitutes were very cooperative and they enjoyed the whole thing. <laughs> so, uh, you know. First, you took on the racism, you said. Yeah, I, I really didn't like that, you know. Uh, I mean, I still don't like it. <laughs> could, could you? you know, I, I mean, one of my basic things, uh, right from when I was young, is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the whole civil rights struggle and racism is something I've, uh, you know, and somebody in New England who's part Native, is I experienced some of that racism directed, like the term Canuck, which is French, uh, French and native mix, you know, uh, you know, it's like hearing that. Uh, but that was always something that was very important to me is, is been, you know, fighting racism. So, I mean, that was something that we took us, you know, we were, for a while we were very involved with the anti-racist stuff, you know, and that got, got its own weirdness, you know, going on. I mean, there was a time where I had to break with the anti-racist alliance because, you know, basically there was a band that was like doing a lot of, they were handing out some really raunchy, sexist flyers, you know. I'd be uh, totally fucked. Uh, and, but I didn't like, feel like their answer to go out and beat the band up on when they're playing. It's like, no, you should have come to a meeting if you want to challenge that, you know. Uh, so that, that was, can you talk about that? That was the dwarves thing. No, the dwarves was a different thing. Okay. But the dwarves kind of led to, uh, I didn't really want sexism because I, I felt like I was still pretty, pretty sexist in a lot of ways myself. That was one of my appeals to punk in the first place. So, but I was also very committed to collectivity and I felt like, you know, cause some of the women that stood up to me and challenged me about it, I, I was like, that's, I, I admire your courage. <laughs> I was like, you did that, you know, that's important, you know, and that's important to the club that you sh should feel like you can do, do that. But when, you know, the thing, cause I was really against the anti-censorship stuff because of my own artwork, I didn't want to, you know. Um, and, uh, so the dwarfs, you know, because at a certain point I knew this issue was going to come up with them because their 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 lyrics were very sexist. So I listened to it and I was frankly didn't like where they were coming from. Uh, but you know, they were a draw. But you know, well, there was one point where you know, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember the guy's the lead singer, <laughs> Blag, Blag, right? Because he threw a symbol right at me, uh, and and somebody else blocked it. He says, oh, you are a magician, aren't you? He says, you're not supposed to do that to me, though. <laughs> so he'd already kind of gotten me annoyed. Or, you know, uh, and then later, there was somebody on the stage, this guy was challenging about sexism. And that was one thing that I was very clear about, is like, the stage should always be available for people to say what they think, and not to get beat up on the stage. Because that was like, that. he had crossed my line on that one. And I said, you know, we're gonna ban the dwarves. And the dwarves are like, how can you, you know? I said, well, I don't want to, because <laughs> I knew where this was going to go. But to me, that's like, you know, I felt like that guy had every right to express that he felt they were being sexist. You know, and frankly, they were. <laughs> I mean, just, you just listen to the lyrics, you know. I, don't, I know they're still around, so I don't know. I, I would assume they still would be, but at that point. Tim was but, a fan of that band. Yeah, that's a strange thing. He, was, he, he would embrace some bands. I mean, there was like... Uh, I remember early days of a band called Non, who weren't skinheads, but they were definitely racist, you know. And I kind of pointed that out to him. It's like, you know, because <laughs> he wasn't aware of that. Uh, 
So um, you, you spoke of uh, controversy, and I'm, I'm not really, is it just because you, like, like the insane thing, or you would, would you just encourage, I mean, I know crash worship got pretty, pretty wild, you know, but, but you, you would try to, is, was that where the controversy emerged? Like, kind of like you said, what, uh, erotic art? Did that, is that? Well, there's a few times where I had some art shows. I showed my art. I mean, I mean, there was one point where one woman came up about, like, how can we tolerate this at Gilman Street? <laughs> you know, or, you know, like, uh, and then there were other people came up and spoke up. That was after, that was when Mike Stan was first coming in, the days of rage, I guess. <laughs> you know, so he wanted me to show my artwork, so I did. Uh, you know, um, the days of rage. It was a three-day all weekend thing, you know. Uh, you know, and we we did some things that were, you know, for the plant pantalemic thing. I mean, where you know, pagan artists would show their stuff, you know. Uh, but you know, I mean, I mean, things that are more controversial. Obviously, the insaints were challenged, pushing lines that people are challenged by, you know. Uh, what do you remember about Miriam as a person, and if you could talk more about her as an artist as well? Uh, well, she was somebody. Uh, I thought she was very creative. She had obviously she was dealing with some heavy issues. She had trauma in her background pretty heavily. You could pretty much pick that up in her lyrics, or uh, and. Uh, And she was interested in like expressing herself. I mean, she was she made a living as a dominatrix. So some of the women that she brought in uh, were, you know, co-workers. <laughs> but you know, she was definitely using her art. I mean, actually, Max from Rock and Roll did one of the most interesting. They did they did a fairly supportive interview of what she was doing. But you know, it was sad because she basically got. I mean, yeah, maybe she's pushing the edge that people didn't want to go. But I, I felt like you know. Well, I liked it when Naked Aggression followed up after she got arrested by the police outside of Gillen Street. She came in with the, uh, you know, fuck the police. <laughs> or, you know, because I was really like, I, I felt like she, you know, I mean, here was a woman that was actually challenging a lot of, you know, your, the sexual, you know, orthodoxies, uh, which I liked. That was a lot of, that was a lot of love. the women and the punk things. I liked the women that kind of challenged that stuff rather than went with with the pro-censorship feminism, which I had some real issues with. Uh, Did you appreciate the Riot Girl movement? Yeah, I like I like the Riot Girl stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, Bikini Kill was obviously. If you listen to their lyrics, she was also dealing. With, you know, Kathleen Hanna was also dealing with some very sexual traumatic situations when she was growing up. I mean, she songs about I don't know how true that's about her father, but listen, to it, it's not like she got going through some abuse. Or, uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, I like, I remember her playing, and I remember we, we danced like crazy afterwards. <laughs> and Marianne was one of the other people I danced with, you know, so he's one. Uh, what, did they have the, the girls to the front thing? Do you remember that whole uh, guys had to stand in the back procedure? Or? I had totally forgotten about that. Yeah, I do actually. Uh, did you abide? Were you, were you okay with it? I was okay with it because I felt like she was, she was trying to express something. Uh, she was doing it creatively. What I don't like is when it's just kind of just like real orthodoxy about dealing with issues. You know, I mean, I was increasingly like, I'm like, actually a lot of the radical feminism of the 70s, I've come, you know, even though I don't totally buy, you know, like, but, you know, I like the fact, you know, I came to embrace a lot of it because I felt it was something at, at that point and things needed to get challenged, you know. But, you know, as a, as a man in the 70s, at a certain point, it got beyond where I was willing to go <laughs> at a certain point. Uh, but that's that's more where I, I feel like people, like research put out a book called Angry Women. Uh, if you want to know what I'm supportive of, that, that's that kind of perspective of not being, you know, shutting down a sexuality. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, like somebody who wants a conventional situation either. You know, the nuclear family I, I'm married to like was create extended families, countercultural situations. And I see kids that are, that raise in that situation. 
where there's a lot of significant adults that aren't considered like your conventional role models. And I think that's important, you know. Actually, you know, I actually got a degree in early childhood and elementary education, which I did. Part of the reason I didn't is not so much because <laughs> uh, there were men that were sexually abusing children, but that certainly wasn't me. But because of my history, that, that made you know I knew that made some hit, some controversy, even though that wasn't where I was going with it. Uh, but I also but I do think it's important that men have a role with working with kids, and that's like Dor- Dorothy Dinnerstein, a mermaid and the Minotaur. I think she had an important point. Like if we're really going to change it, we have to change. Well, basically, men's relationship to children, where they see that there's a, a role, you know, a good role, <laughs> you know, not necessarily holding conventional masculine roles, but you know, like more freedom, you know, to, well, because we were changing things, you know. Uh, that happened to Gilman. No, I don't. <laughs> I just it was just something I was, uh, but you know the issue of sexuality was obviously, you know, and the whole issue, like, because basically people, there was a movement, okay, first we're not gonna have the racism, and then, you know, we just challenged that, and, you know, sexism came, and then eventually banning bands that were corporate, you know, corporately sponsored, you know, so, I mean, but for me, I was going through my own evolution of what what I was considering political correct, a certain amount of, like, a certain degree, I was kind of in, coming to that point of view, you know, even though I wasn't like heavily into the censorship stuff, but a certain amount, and I was okay with it, just like later with the pirate radio station, we went through the same process, like, you know, uh, so I had to talk to some hip hop kids about, you know, you don't use certain words, you can't, you know, be offensive to to your sisters, uh, so. It, uh, you were, you're saying that, that men, you know, Teaching men, that there's a you know the unconventional relationship with with children. You know, and I just see at Gilman, there's so many role models. You, know, you come into the situation, and your peers happen to be older than you. So it, it did seem like what you're saying though that, that that was going on at Gilman in many ways. Yeah, no, I definitely saw myself as kind of a well, sometimes I even call myself Grandpa Punk because <laughs> I was obviously older than you know. So I did see. You know, uh, you know, I still see myself as a role model. Like, so you don't have to fit into their system. You know, you can still be who you are, express yourself, and get away with it. <laughs> Do you have you any know? memories of, of working with, with Jim Wittes, the, the landlord? Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you talk about Jim and, and, and was he supportive? Yeah, he was very supportive. You I mean, want to make sure he got the rent. But, you know, it was, it was, there was weird situations coming up because he had these women come in and do basket weaving and they do their classes. <laughs> you know, they comment, they look around and see the graffiti and, you know, uh, you know, no, he was easy to work with, you know. And, you know, I, uh, part of the thing is because I was making sure the rent was paid, you know. Uh, you know uh, but, yeah, it was, it was an easy going relationship, you know. So... He's, you know, he's very supportive in a lot of ways. He liked what was happening there. I mean, he says he could have rented. Well, in the beginning, he said maybe it would have been harder to rent it, but <laughs> but at a certain point, you know, obviously it would have been harder to reconvert that space because it'd be a lot of work to do. <laughs> but he always seemed very supportive. He's, he's you know, uh, it's probably not the music he went home and listened to, but uh, but he, he found it interesting. Uh, do you uh, can you tell us a bit more? You see, you went from doing the art committee to being a head coordinator and booking. What were some of the other roles that you would do as a head coordinator? I mean, the main job was getting the rent paid, but what else would you do as head coordinator? Well, one of the things that I, was, that I came in beginning is to make sure that I was in close with the security. Uh, you know, besides just the chance that I want to make sure that when it came down to it, we were going to challenge the, you know, what was happening with the, the racism. But there was a certain amount, because I wanted to make sure that they got paid a little bit, because I wanted to count on them. I didn't want to keep trying to get volunteers switching over. I wanted to have a, a, I was very, at the beginning, I'm going to have a relationship with you. I've done security. It's, it's important I can count on you guys. And it was guys at the beginning. I thought there were some women that came in that were actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, what did you, uh, so, you, uh, for a certain point, there was many black bunks. There was George, Motorhead, Nando, Shammy. Like, how did their presence affect the kind of latent racism of some of the of the punks? 
Uh, I think they were part of like directly challenging it, and, and but you know ways like George went out of his way to talk to a lot of the people that were part of the skinhead thing and winning them over, you know, trying to you know in a certain way because there was a commonality being a skinhead, uh, you know. So he went out of his way, you know. Uh, but you know, I think there was. I mean, the guy who was the head of the security before, he was like, he, you know, he just didn't want to go where. He's like, no, we got to get along with these people. And I'm like, no, we don't. <laughs> and he didn't think that I could do it. And I said, that I can do this fine. And I was basically, I wanted somebody, I said, there was two things I want. Somebody knows how to fight, but can take a blow. You know, because a lot of times that in mean, security, you know, you get, <laughs> it happens, you know, you don't feel like if you get hit that you have to respond, you know. Or, you know. Uh, uh, so, so that was important to me. It's like you know, uh, and, and given the shows that we were doing we were right from the get go, I mean, within a week of like people saying, "Okay, you're it," and within a week, everybody's looking at me like I'm the leader, like I'm supposed to know what to do. <laughs> and a lot of that was like, "Well, you know, we got a Christ on parade, and this is a pretty gnarly show, and we gotta, we gotta get on top of this right away," you know. So, uh, so I was glad that I spent the time connecting. Uh, because a lot of a lot of my early shows was just doing, you, know, you know, some of those big shows like when things were, and of course that's why they wanted to shut us down because there was all this drinking going out because obviously it wasn't allowed in the club so a lot of it was just trying to get people, the rollers are coming and get rid of it, <laughs> you know, because it was, you know, and that was something that the, the city wasn't too happy about the police weren't we were happy about all that drinking and I wasn't really happy that it was that out of con it was out of control. <laughs> I mean, they would have had a valid reason for closing us down for nuisance, so I'm glad they didn't. But that was pretty hairy in some of the stuff that was going on. I mean, I mean, one situation I remember is there was this 15-year-old girl, and she, she was wearing the skimpy thing out, but she was just drunk on the side of the sidewalk, so it's like, I can't just leave her there. <laughs> so I'm trying to bring her to the club. And one of the police, like, he goes, and he says, you got a good job. And he was going like, it's like, no, you don't understand. Because I, I went in and it's like, where's your boyfriend? And I found him and I chewed him out. And it's like, you can't leave your girlfriend on the side of the sidewalk just totally plastered. You know, she could have died, you know. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's the kind of stuff. Like, am I, it's part of me felt guilty, you know. It's like, okay, I'm a, you know, I mean, I care about these teenagers, but, uh, you know, is it good to be allowing... Yeah, or I'm st you know, I'm doing with street youth now. I'm still doing the same issue, like, you know, what's, you know, is it a good role, a good model to, like, be tolerant of this stuff? A certain degree, it was like, I don't feel that good about it, you know, and I want, you know. And one of the things we started was an AA. Because <laughs> I saw we really needed an AA. I mean, I'm, you know, I do harm reduction stuff, but I felt like there was enough problems there. You know, and there are people like, listen, I know you're doing speed, and I want you to stop. You know, some of those gnarlier drugs, you know, but, you know, I was just playing, packing away the 40s, and I was doing it myself. I was sneaking away, drinking with uh, the local hookers. <laughs> That's where I'd go hide out, uh, you know, because they were still up there. You know, I remember one one cold night, she's like, the police are going to pick us up tonight, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there was one time one of the, the local prostitutes, she got raped. She was getting raped in some one of the bands. They stopped the rape, so it was like cool. <laughs> and I was kind of like, any if you folks have you sex workers have any problems, you know, just tell my boys and they'll take care of it. <laughs> you know. Nice. Yeah, can you talk about the Let a Thousand Clubs Bloom flyer? Uh, you wanted. Oh yeah, yeah. Advocating change at Gilman. What did it say, and how was it received? Uh, well, it was definitely. Challenging people, but I, you know, that's part of my punk thing is a challenge, or whatever orthodoxy. And you know, so, uh, but there was a certain amount of also shifting. I mean, because originally I was kind of looking at what's the next scene going to come. So I was looking for something that had some pagan energy, which, you know, some of that was the rave scene that came. Uh, some of that, you know, some other stuff. You know, I saw some of the heavy metal stuff by, you know, partially by, you know, people, they're being Satanists, but I also felt they were challenging the Christian right-wing agenda that was so predominant during the Reagan years. Uh, uh, but, you know, I mean, I was looking for something that was kind of like, more like, even though I wasn't totally new age stuff, there was part of me like, we need to do something on the positive side, you know, to like, 
save the world, basically, you know, give you, you know. Uh, so I didn't see it really evolving at that point, you know. I'm hoping it's starting to emerge now. I'm one of those like, okay, the age of Aquarius is actually kicking in now. <laughs> uh, the Mayan prophecy and all that, the Rainbow Nation stuff. Uh, but I, yeah, I was kind of hoping something like that would hope, you know. But there was also a certain amount, like, because part of the thing was a broom. Because I was, I was also saying that that's part of the revolution, as you guys. <laughs> so I guess that's kind of like changing the roles, you know. Like we all got to kind of step in and like this is our club, so we got to, you know, mop, sweep. <laughs> uh, so there's a certain amount of saying that too, which is to me is like that's you know, uh, you know, taking collective responsibility, you know, and, and some of that means to doing, you know, er, you know, everybody needs to join in that, <laughs> you know. I mean, I still challenge with that. I'm still a slob. <laughs> I'm having to challenge that in my personal life, you know. Right. What what is what was a, a thousand clubs of bloom? What were you trying to do there? What does that mean? What is it? Let, let a thousand clubs of bloom. Well, it was obviously a takeoff, and the, the Mao was saying about you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, and there was also a thing about let a thousand parks bloom in terms of people's park. Because I've been in, well later on, I got involved with all the people's park, but I was. Uh, well, that was kind of an affirmation that there needs to be more do-it-yourself clubs, you know, that this needs a, this would, it would be nice if we had a lot of clubs and whatever your thing is, as long as it's done collectively, you know, so, and not just have it be a punk thing, you know, but to actually, like, let a lot of it, because I felt it would allow more creativity, the more, you know, I'm a big believer that, you know. You create these temporary autonomous zones as they later. I had come Bay talked about that's you know I was kind of looking at that uh, you know a certain amount of music being liberatory uh, you know and I wanted to see that keep evolving not to get stuck in certain like I mean this was <laughs> uh, I mean that was our criticism of hip the hippies and there even though we've kind of gone back to a lot of that <laughs> you know but you know and that was one of my frustrations with punk is when it became a formula rather than, you know, a creative expression, you know. It's like, okay, it's a new conformity. Uh, so you said that you were on the on the East Coast for a while. When did you come to California? Uh, first came out in 76, because I went to Antioch College and they had like student co-ops. So I actually worked for, work with our teenagers who had mental health issues from, from a Carl Jung perspective. So I came out for six months. Came out in 77, the summer of hate. <laughs> 10 years after summer, a low, you know. That's why, you know, because I, I like to say I was the first gutter punk in Berkeley because I had safety pins and spiked hair and a sleeping bag. <laughs> so you know, I had, that's when I started experiencing some periods of homelessness. And then I moved out in 79, worked at the Union place for two more years, and then really kind of like extended the homelessness period, which is an important part because that's a big part of my work is working people on the streets. Did you uh, see any kind of resistance to like Berkeley, which is one of the, you know, it's one of the, uh, uh, is it, it's one of the uh, homes of the hippie, I guess. Did you see any resistance to punk culture at that time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the early punk uh, stuff in different parts of the country, more if you got Sada, Berkeley was being more accepting and, you know, but other times I was like, I go to some, <laughs> places the only music place was a disco which I did go to discos because that's my buy stuff was coming in <laughs> you know uh, uh, but you know I remember early punk got a lot you know intense reactions a lot of times like times when you didn't get to get your show done because <laughs> you being going to run out you know I mean I you know there's one time at Antioch I was asked to like do your punk thing because I was a dancer so I was like okay I'll do my punk thing <laughs> they didn't react to it. It was kind of, you know, there's one guy who's like, bang, you know, bang on the thing. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Which, of course, as a punk, is like, that's great. <laughs> you want that kind of reaction, right? You know, but other people. But, you know, there was also, you know, a place like Antioch was pretty, you know, it's definitely on the liberal side in Berkeley. So, you you know, there's other people like, well, this is interesting. I don't know what to make of it, but it's, uh, we like it because it's something else. It's something new, you know, because there was a lot of, you know, there's there are clubs that were, you know, dealing with, with punk at that point in, in San Francisco. I mean, San Francisco was obviously some interesting stuff. So there were people getting, 
that weren't sure what to make of it, but they, they were liked it because it was something different. Yeah. And at that point, it was you know pretty creative, the stuff that was going on. Can you talk about the, the band Blatz? What was it like seeing that band? They were, they were pretty chaotic, yeah? Well, I think they're kind of the archetypal band that came out of that period because they're all people that came from our scene. Uh, and uh, they were fun. They were definitely challenging some, some of the limits. Uh, yeah. It was interesting seeing them. I mean, they, they just got that reunion show where they filled up Gilman Street, which they never would have done back then. That's one of the things I'm finding interesting is bands that you know would not have filled up the club, but suddenly, like I wanted to see Filth, and I couldn't get in. <laughs> it was sold out, like on a Sunday afternoon. It's like, okay. It's like, you know, because that's, because I think there's a certain mystique for that period, like people really are interested in that. Like my, my nephew, for instance, <laughs> it's like, because he was very into the punk thing, he was very into Rancid, so I gave him a, one Christmas, I just gave him all the flyers. Here's the first Rancid flyer. <laughs> yeah, all right, so, so, you know, because you know, Gilman did get a certain amount of national attention, you know, so people are interested in that. I've got a few more questions, but were there any stories that you knew that you wanted to share that maybe we didn't talk about? I'm hmm. sure there's many, but any that stood out to you before you got here? Uh, well, it's where I decided to like go back to the free clinic and do my peer counseling because I mean I talked about being the role model, but a lot of times I was just you know hearing the kids' stories and like a lot of them were from pretty rough, you know, the throwaways like their parents like get out and they hit the road and there was a certain amount of you know just like in the hippies there's a certain amount of flop house stuff people kind of take in and we were the family uh, in a way. I mean, obviously they got to a point. Well, that's where the landlord got a little mad. It's like we were letting too many people stay over, you know. Or, you know. Um, but, you know, I mean, the thing is, I, I mean, it's one of the things I'm really proud of, you know. I mean, it wasn't easy, but we survived. And the fact the club's still there, uh, or that, you know, even though the, the fact that it was a scene was the most important thing to me at a certain point. Uh, that we were kind of a, an alternative family, <laughs> extended family in a way for the kids, you know. Uh, but there's some pretty damn good music came out of that scene too. Uh, there were some shows that, I, like like Offspring, this is one of the shows I always remember. Uh, it was like the Gulf War started, so they, they had a thing about bombing Tehran, so they turned it to bombing Baghdad, which was exactly what's going on. And And I'm looking at, just about everybody here is draft age, you know? So this has got to be on their minds. Or, uh, you know, when they did that, like all the lighters came out all at once. And there was this sense of intense unity, like none of us liked what was going on there, <laughs> you know, including the fact that a lot of them may actually, you know, if this goes gnarly, that they may be facing going over there. Uh, and that was like, that was in a sense of real intense unity. We were all like against this war. You know, and it was a very, a very intense situation. So that was my favorite show. Was that, <laughs> you know, and Offspring used to like get us out of LA. There's not much going on. I said, well, come on, drive up. You're always welcome here. You know, uh, that's a wonderful story. We're interviewing them next week, so okay. we'll definitely ask them about that because they have the song Tehran, but you said they changed the name to Baghdad. Yeah, yeah, because that was totally relevant to what was going on. Because it just the war just started and they're bombing the hell out of Baghdad. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, you, you, one of my last questions, I have a few more, but ask you about how you feel that Gilman is still here and, and, and the importance of that. But also, um, you went on to do community organizing, continue to do homeless advocacy, and that actually inspired uh, Jesse Townley to run for office. He said that really, that in, in many ways, you, you encouraged him to communicate with the city for Gilman, and that he saw that it was kind of possible. Um, so there's a few points there. Let's, let's start with, with what you continue to do in, in, in the local community as far as activism and advocacy. Well, that's a, that brings another story that's flashed in my mind because you know, they were trying to close us down. They're using all these permits and all that. And Jesse had a lot to do with going to the neighborhood, knocking on the doors. And the thing that, I, the story is like, you know, at a certain point, 150 punks showed up the zoning commission. And they basically told us this was the end of our <laughs> It's like, 
we'll give you whatever you want. Make sure they never come back again. <laughs> that was it. That was like the, the city just like gave up. <laughs> like, you know, they were trying everything they do to close us down. And the fact that 150 punks showed up at the zoning commission where that's not a usual sort of thing. Uh, you know, and Jesse going door to door in the neighborhood and getting support, you know. I mean, that's part of why the club's there. So yeah, I guess that was the start of his political stuff. So, yeah. Uh, he said that he got that, he knew that it was possible because you had been already kind of doing that in the local community. Like you encouraged him to say, hey, or you, you encouraged him to understand that he could yeah. interact with the kind of, uh, do you remember his campaign to run for, for council and, 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 and ultimately run for Were you supportive of that? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't actively participate in the city council, but I was glad that he ran, because at that point, uh, I think that's how I was still Green Party, because he was running on the Green Party thing. I mean, now I'm peace and freedom, but, uh, uh, you know, people want me to run at some point, <laughs> which I have mixed feelings about, but maybe at some point. <laughs> so, um, so you, you, can you talk about some of the things that you do now? Uh, homeless advocacy, uh, Pirate Radio. What, what are some of the things you continue to do in the, in the local community? Well, there was a thing, like, because in the 90s we had Free Radio Berkeley. That was Stephen Dunifer's thing. And then it got closed down, and then KPFA got shut down. So I got, uh, so some of us from, I hope the FC. Well, I guess if anybody from the FCC is saying I'm outing myself as one of those people that was a connection point. Uh, so, so we didn't want to just see KPFA go on, so we decided to, uh, you know, use the same frequency and go on and on the air. So I was kind of the, again, a, like collective, but you know, a certain amount, at a certain point, like people like, well, you're the man, obviously. Uh, but that's another do-it-yourself project, and, uh, you know. That was hard to organize collectively because DJs tend to be much more individualistic, you know. But I, I hung in there for nine and a half years, and I still. So well, it's basically out of West Oakland, right? <laughs> it's not reaching very far, so I'm a little frustrated with it. I'm not nearly as involved, but I think that was important. It's free radio, Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, Berkeley Liberation Radio. That incarnation was. That's where I had a lot to do with it. Uh, so that was a, definitely another do-it-yourself project. <laughs> Are you still involved with Berkeley Liberation Radio? Yeah, yeah, I still try to do Saturday at noon. Sometimes I get discouraged because it's not reaching very far. I mean, people can do the internet thing, and I guess people listen that way. And I guess I'm entertaining people like what I do. I guess I mix up the, you know, I'll do a little local coverage. But it's a little more tricky because I'm more Berkeley-based, you know, so. Uh, so I feel like I gotta at least stay on top of what's happening in West Oakland, you know which is gentrification. Well, of course, now we have the porch shut down. <laughs> but it's all, uh, you know, and then, because uh, I want to inform, because one of the things I realized is you can't just talk to people on, the, on an intellectual level. You also have to hit them on the emotional level. So I use the music to kind of, you know, well, for me, it helps me process stuff. I, music's always heals. <laughs> so and I, I'm all over the place, though I play a lot more women than men, <laughs> so that a lot of, a lot of our women listen to my show and a lot of people aren't sexually straight listen to my show because they, they feel like I'm, <laughs> some of the stuff, because I'm trying to, you know. Uh, yeah, so in the street situation, because uh, a, a lot of, I'm actually talking to a lot of street youth. I mean, the interesting thing is, there used to be a lot of gutter punks out there, there's not nearly as many. On Telegraph, there's a lot of people in the Grateful Dead, which is kind of, <laughs> I heard, because I'm kind of reimbursing it, embracing that kind of a perverse thing, because I hated the dead for a while. <laughs> That's part of what drew me into punk in the first place, but I've kind of come back to them. And then, you know, there's a crew downtown Shattuck, they're into the same clown posse. <laughs> they paint up their faces, which is, yeah. but, you know, these are using music to create kind of, you know, some kind of group identity. So, so uh, not that I'm that into the insane clown posse, but they they like what a, they like me. <laughs> Juggalos and deadheads as opposed to like crusties or scum punks. Yeah, yeah, you don't see a whole lot of that latter group anymore, where it used to be very prevalent. Um, oh. Makes me wish for the old days. 
Well, I don't know if they're coming back. <laughs> yeah. Are you, uh, so my, my last question is, is about the Gilman. Uh, your thoughts on it still being there and, and the importance of it? Uh, yeah, I don't go very often, but every time I go, I used to enjoy myself, actually. I just feel out of place because I, I obviously don't have the punk look, and so a lot of the younger, it's like, you know, it's kind of strange for me to go to a situation where a lot of the kids that are going there now weren't even born. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or, you know, they, they're like, who are you, you know? Or, or sometimes they see me dancing around, like, well, yeah, you, look like, you look like a hippie, you're still cool. <laughs> and if you, every once in a while, this strange rumor goes on, like, at some point, you're the one that started. No, that was Tim Hannon. <laughs> it wasn't me. Uh, but yeah, I, I am part of your history, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, well, I mean, you didn't have the look back then, did you, either? Uh, well, uh, Punk look, I guess. I was a little less hippie oriented. Maybe not. I was certainly wasn't doing the skinheads. <laughs> or, you know, uh, you know. But you know, some of the early punk stuff. Like, you know, Joey Ramone had long hair. It wasn't, you know, Iggy had long hair. So. <laughs> uh, Did, uh, you, you're happy the club's still around, then? I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm very proud that it's still around. You know, and it seems like. I mean, actually, you know, most of the time I go and, you know, it seems like they're actually fairly, they're getting into, you know, it seems to be a certain amount of diversification of what's the music. I, I, actually, every time I, you know, every time I go, I enjoy myself and I like the music, you know. I like, it's just that uh, feeling out of place that it's a little awkward for me. Well, yeah. A lot of people that are still there owe a lot to you for keeping it alive, man, so. Yeah, I think they do. And I'm damn proud of it. <laughs> Michael, thanks for speaking with us. You kicked it. You kicked the butt, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you kindly. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, it, we have a long haul. But I'm, I'm very proud to have your voice. I mean, you're one of the head coordinators that, that kept it alive right after Tim, you know. Yeah. Well, I think it's because that was where the, the scene emerged. <laughs> I mean, the old Max and Rock and Roll is definitely a scene. But sure enough. That was important to me. It's like one of the things, like, okay, what's the difference? What's how, what's the commonality between Ashkenaz, where the grateful dead, there's a whole scene there. But that's what I like about it. I'm like going to close where you're, <laughs> you know, you don't, if you don't connect with somebody right away, you're never going to see him again. Uh, that's not like Gilman. You still see everybody there. I mean, you still, you had lunch with Jesse the other day. You continue to have relationships with people. Yeah, no, I continue to have relationships with people there when I see them, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I see eight point one. A lot, you know. Well, he went on to the long haul because I think the, the shift in the long haul had a lot to do with what we were doing. You know, that shift that happened in '91 there. It kind of moved to the long haul. Yeah, some of it was coming out of Barrington. Uh, you know, Barrington is actually one of the places where punk <laughs> earlier was important to the punk scene. You know? uh, but yeah, yeah, I, you know. Uh, oh, I ran into Tall Tim the other day. <laughs> Uh, really? Yeah, I run into him every once in a while. What's he doing? Uh, well, because he already did some kind of, he didn't get to the details, but he sort of seems like he's kind of more on the science, <laughs> science sort of thing, just like Jonathan was coming out of the science. God, I remember it's all Tim. Yeah, I guess there was some controversy with it. Huh? Yeah, there was in the girls' bathroom, there was a hole in the wall that said, they wrote, Tall Tim, Memorial People. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? But he, he certainly. Yeah. He kept. He, he, was, he was one of the people, Mike Stan, that I remember. You know. Well, so, he, was a, he was a steady guy, you know. I mean, I, I mean a lot of us. That's why we, we, we clamped down on the Sunday shows, which is why we didn't get Nirvana. <laughs> to, you know? Like Jesse's like, he's the one that canceled. No, I'm the one that canceled Nirvana. <laughs> Now, I would have liked to have seen them actually in Rich because I just didn't know who they were. I was just tired. Of ten, Paul Tim and I were tired of working on Sunday shows because you know, we, well, I had a job. <laughs> it was different that I had to do, you know. So, yeah, you canceled her. <laughs> I canceled her. Because, <laughs> you know, Jesse's like, we can't do that. We got to give these sub pop people a chance. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm just too many Sunday shows. <laughs> uh, wow. So it wasn't for any political reason? No. No, I, actually, in retrospect, I would have probably enjoyed seeing them, but I just didn't know. I mean, okay. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Right on.